All right, so tonight we're going to talk about collecting bottles. And not only just bottles, we're going to talk about perfume. And we're going to talk about, like, when were perfumes commercialized? And what did they do before they were commercialized? And first, we're going to go over the different kinds of bottles that you might find when you collect. And most of them will be glass. You will find some that are made out of porcelain, some made out of mother of pearl, all different kinds of materials, but mostly glass. And so we have here a smorgasbord of different bottles that were made uh, actually during the Victorian era and before, some in the early 20th century, and some even up until uh, contemporary times, uh, as late as the 70s or 80s. Okay, so which one out of all of these is my favorite? Oh my God, I can't even tell you. Uh, it's too hard to decide. So perfumes and the vessels that they came in, uh, started even way back before modern times, even during the actual Roman times, the Egyptian times. And uh, yeah, pretty much perfumes were actually, when they first were uh, starting to be made thousands of years ago, it was mostly for the royal families. Uh, if there was King Tut, I'm sure King Tut had a scent. <laughs> and uh, the pharaohs and the Roman senators and stuff like that. And the nobility, the people, uh, kings and queens and courtesans and stuff like that. And then it became more mainstream for regular people to own perfumes. Actually, the oils that were made um, into scented oils, like for example, like rose oils and certain kinds of flowers were exotic and expensive. So it was only basically made for people of wealth. Okay, so what do we have here? And I'm going to tell you right now, I don't know which one is my favorite, but I love all of them. This one is actually quite interesting. If you look here, this uh, beautiful chatelaine type of bottle. So this would have actually hung from a chain, uh, possibly from a lady's belt. Now, I don't know how old this one is, but I know it's at least Victorian, if not pre-Victorian. And so from the possible mid 1800s to about 1870 or so, 1880. And so we have this gorgeous little vessel here. As you look, it's very oddly shaped. And it almost, it almost, I don't smoke pot. So what do I know? But it reminds me of a bong or some kind of like marif a marijuana paraphernalia or smoking paraphernalia. But if you look on one end, we have an opening and on another end, we have an opening. I don't understand what this was meant for. Who knows? Maybe it's like a miniature opium smoking pipe. I have no clue, but I believe that it once held perfume in it because when I took off this tip and I took off this little cap, I actually get a whiff of some kind of scented smell that smells actually quite lovely. And so if you look at this, it almost looks like it could possibly be Venetian. Venetian or Italian glass, but I could be wrong. I'm no expert. And I love the lemony yellow color. And uh, this one is really, really quite thin. It's a very lightweight glass. But if you look inside, you'll see like a little glass straw in there. I don't know if you can see that in there. There's a little glass straw in there to actually help to uh, pull up the perfume that's in this bottle, which is quite strange. I don't know how it works, but I guess the liquid would go through the little straw that's in here and actually right through here. You can see that. I don't know, underneath the little golden or brass cap, you can see the straw leading out. Now, I don't know if the straw leads out to the other side as well. I don't know if it goes up through here. No, it doesn't. So I don't know what the hell the meaning of this is. I think this is the vessel part that you pour the perfume into with maybe a funnel. And then you would actually dab some of it out through the little straw in here onto your wrist. If anyone knows, write it in the comments below. All right, next. What else do we have? We have large, we have medium, and we have teeny tiny. So over here, we have teeny tiny. And this is Victorian, actually probably like 1880s to about uh, maybe the 1890s. I could be wrong. It could be earlier. And this looks French or Bohemian. We have a little gem on the top that's uh, almost like a, a faux sapphire. And the bottle is actually faceted and it's like a gem. If you look at that, look at that. I don't know, it's like almost opal inside. You could see like those little sp speckles of something inside of there, almost like a gem itself. Look at that, you see the little 
Look at that. When I move it all around, I don't know what that is that's inside of there. Now, it could be smelling salts. And I haven't actually opened this up. Let's try to open it up and see if we can see if there's smelling salts in there. And what are smelling salts? Not all of these contain liquid. There would be something called smelling salts. Let's try to get a, a look in there. Can we even see in there? Smelling salts were actually these ammonia type of pellets that would go in bottles that would actually wake somebody up. So if a lady fainted or passed out, she would take a whiff and it would actually rouse her. Um, a lot of corsets made it so that it was very hard to breathe and the smells were uh, hideous in the uh, Victorian country. So what do I mean by hideous? Here's an example. In, I believe it was 1900, in New York City, there was over 2 million pounds of horse shit. Yeah, I'm going to say it. Horse shit deposited in the streets daily. And what did they do with that 2 million pounds of horse shit? Basically, they would take brooms and sweep it into the curb. And no, there were probably no sewers really around there at the time. And so the horse shit would permeate through the air, making it almost, especially in summer months, unbearable to actually walk around because the smell was just god awful so a lady would take a little travel size vial with her with sweet smelling perfume or some kind of scent or oil in it and raise it up to her nose just to like actually like sort of like cancel out the nasty horseshit smell and bo bo was a bad 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 thing that happened during the victorian times some people including i think it was queen elizabeth once uh, said that she doesn't take a bath for at least one month. And so people didn't bathe as much as we do today. And uh, thankfully, they had these little vials to save them from the smells around them. People smell like absolute barnyard animals. And you can imagine how bad the whiffs of the smells from people's bodies were. So you had to, especially on a chatelaine chain, carry around something with you just to like make it so that you didn't pass out. All right, so let's check out. So we had in the Victorian era also these little glass vials, lay down bottles like this. This would lay down. Also, it has a spot where you can uh, attach it to a chatelaine chain. You, ha you see the little loop there and it could have slung from her waistband. Uh, we have, let's check out some more. We also have, again, more of these little vials. This is French. It's opaline glass. It's white opaline glass. We have this uh, really cool pattern on there. And now we have barber bottles. And what the heck are barber bottles? So basically at a barber shop, either a man, well, <laughs> actually I was going to say a woman, but barber shops are really for men. Um, they would have like all sorts of liquids in these bottles, such as alcohol and aftershave and oils for the hair and pomades and lotions placed in these bottles. So as you can see, these um, have these little spritzer tops on them, and they're really fun to collect. A lot of times you'll find them enameled like these, and these are really quite beautiful. These are most likely bohemian, and it's a, a place uh, that we all know today as like the Czech Republic, but it was not too far from the border of Austria and Germany. And so it's very even, even though it's a Slavic country, it's almost Germanic as well. And so the people in Bohemia actually had very, very high deposits of lead. And that's why their glass is exquisite. So Bohemian glass is exquisite. Here's another Bohemian example. A very, very early atomizer bottle. Now this one was made circa about 1900, possibly just a tad earlier, 1890s. And uh, we see this uh, gorgeous Aladdin style top. And it reminds me of a, an Aladdin's genie bottle with the original uh, atomizer bulb, which is really, really rare to find like this. And this is like a pinched design. As you can see, it's uh, pinched on all sides here with this gorgeous gold gilding. Now this is uh, like a, a stunning turquoise almost color or cobalt. All right, let's go on to the next. So we got our barber bottles, we got our lay down bottles, our vials, our chatelaines, and now we go into, again, another Victorian bottle, this one being Dutch with a silver top. They generally had stoppers, and nine times out of the, uh, ten times you find these, they will not have the stoppers with them. They go missing. They get broken. And so this one is Dutch with a silver top. Really quite lovely travel size. 
And again, a lady would go to an apothecary or a druggist or a dry goods store and purchase the oil separately and uh, have her own fancy bottle. Then we have commercialized perfumes. And when did they start? They actually had them as early as the 1870s, um, 1860s. So perfume would already come in a bottle, but it didn't get really popular until about the teens to the 20s. And then so companies, perfume makers, would actually sell the bottle with the perfume in it. And these were generally made to be thrown out when they were done. But we're actually happy to see these because they actually were not thrown out after the bottles were empty. So this particular one, I forgot the name of this company, uh, has a three-bottle caddy with three different scents in it. And this is unmistakably French. And here we go. So we have a three-cent bottle caddy. And uh, so there's another such example. Now we have another kind of uh, perfume container here. This is actually a piston pump atomizer uh, made by Marcel Frank, and they called this Le Kid. Le Kid. And so this would go in a lady's purse, and this was made sometime in the 20s. And this one has a gorgeous tortoiseshell design. Uh, the tortoiseshell is made out of celluloid. It's actually not tortoiseshell. And so this would be something that you would place in your pocket, and as, as you can see, it's a little stuck. It has a spring in it, and you would just pump it up and down. And then when you were done, you would push this down and press the top part of it and turn it into, I think it's a clockwise position, and it would stay down. And you wanted when you wanted to use it, you would push your finger on it and turn it into a counterclockwise position, and the pump would pop up and you can use it. All right, next, we have another piston pump atomizer, which is really great. And this one is French as well. The hardware and the metal is made in France as well as the glass. And generally companies such as, I'm going to say it wrong, Lalique, um, companies such as uh, Nancy, Nancy uh, Down Nancy, and oh, this is uh, actually loose on the top. I'm tightening it. And companies such as Baccarat made glass uh, for these pieces. And so another company would make the hardware. And again, we have this pump action. And uh, these are really cool. These were made from about circa 1905 to about 1930. They were never popular for one reason, because they spilled all over ladies' gloves, including hooker gloves. <laughs> and so they had these little, you see the little openings in here? And what would happen is it would spill out all over the ladies' gloves and stain them. And so these never really were quite popular because people would, would always get put, pissed off at these and complain and return them to stores. And so that is another idea and why you don't see these too often. All right. Next we have this one. This is an 1850s perfume bottle that was made in France of opaline glass. And this was uh, actually a tourist piece or a souvenir. And it was actually purchased near the Palais Royal in France, which was the Royal Palace. And these are actually very, very rare. You'll see them in different color glass, such as blue, turquoise, lemon, pink, white, and this color too, which is clam broth. And it almost looks like a, a white, but with a hint of gray. And uh, those are very rare. And last but not least, we have this commercial bottle back here, but you must be wondering what this is. This is a snuff bottle. It is not a perfume bottle, but I put it along with my perfume bottles because I think it's really cool. This one being made during the Biedemeyer era, which is between, I believe, 1840 to 1860. This has a actual funny comical saying on it. Somebody had uh, deciphered it for me. Thank you, by the way, uh, in a previous video saying basically sniff brother and you'll be in Haiti. And that's in German. And this is a actual Bavarian bottle, actually also known as Bohemian because around uh, the same area of geography these were made in. And uh, all hand blown. Look at the swirls going through this. Hand cut on a wheel and uh, not actually molded and made by the thousands. These were handcrafted, one of a kind pieces. One side has forget me nots and the other side has that silly comical message. And so now we're going to get to our commercial perfumes, which this is a Guerlain bottle known as the Royal uh, Imperial Bee Bottle. And these are highly collectible. Everybody wants to get their hands on one of these gilded bee bottles. 
and in 1859, the House of Gorlin made a perfume specifically for Empress Eugenie, who was the wife of Napoleon III. And this one, Imperial, uh, has, I think, 60-something gilded bees on it. And I think uh, in gold paint. So it's either like 18 carat, 14 carat, or 24K paint. And this is gorgeous. This is actually hand-painted. This is, uh, even though it's a commercial bottle, this was hand-painted by hand. And actually, there's uh, people still making and producing this perfume today even though it was originally made in 1859. And this one company that actually paints the bottles for Guerlain only has three artists actually doing this today. And those three artists can only produce between 8 to 15 of these bottles per day. Now, these bottles came in different sizes, and the bigger, the better, if you're collecting. So a bottle such as this was probably made in the 70s or 80s, and you can check by the stopper. So if you find one of these in a thrift store and you want to know if you have an early version, the earlier, the more valuable, like if we're talking a 19th century version or an early 20th century version, there's where the value is. But this one, unfortunately, has a plastic stopper. So, you know, since it has plastic on it, it's more contemporary. Very sad. Very sad for value. But uh, this bottle still, as it is, uh, made from like possibly like the 70s or 80s, still carries a value of about $175 to $200, empty. Now, if you find these bottles with the actual perfume in it, sealed, it's going to be worth about seven to $800. And again, in a big bottle like this, that would be seven to $800. People actually collect old perfume that's decades old or even 100 years old because believe it or not, like fine wine, Perfume actually uh, smells better and gets better with time, which is quite strange. Although also if you get the same perfume that say like was made a hundred years ago, over the years and decades, they actually change the formula. And a lot of people prefer the older version of the perfumes. Now in collecting these bottles, I wanted to find out more about them. And so in 1870, I found this really interesting. There's a company by the name of Hoyt, and it was a German cologne, Hoyt's German cologne. They came out with these little cards, these actual trade cards that actually were perfumed. So around 1871, uh, they developed the concept of trade cards that was soaked with cologne, and they freely distributed these cards as advertising samples. So basically, that's your first perfume sample. Um, before it like actually took off mainstream and they made at least 50 unique cards which is quite interesting and here we have the frog and he's holding the Hoyt's cologne don't know if you could see that but there you go Hoyt's German cologne on a card now here's another perfume trade card and this is by W.J. Austin Perfume Company and uh, that is really awesome it was uh, called Austin's Forest Flower Cologne. And uh, this company actually uh, had perfume trade cards, it says. They produced perfume trade cards in the late 19th century. And they launched their first fragrance in 1868. So as you can see, we did have ca uh, actually uh, commercialized perfumes being made in the Victorian era, but they weren't as popular as the 20s and on. Now, here's a early uh, 20th century uh, dated 1901 ad for toiletries. And you see they actually had perfume bottles already made with the perfume in it. They sold perfume soaps and lotions as well. And uh, they called it and toilet soaps. <laughs> and uh, I never uh, got like when you buy a bottle of perfume, it's like eau de toilet. Uh, to uh, I can't even say it in French. Toilet or toilette or toilet. <laughs> it just reminds me of a toilet bowl. Now, during the early part of the 20th century, which is quite interesting, governments began to recognize the power of advertising to get their message across to consumers and, in other words, the civilians. So this was particularly apparent during the First World War, which was 1914 to 1918. And when advertising was actually used as a hallucinogenic to actually uh, pretty much 
sort of like brainwash people into buying products. And uh, it was like psyops. And so uh, the industry actually tried to expand, especially during and after the First World War. So it was psychology. And the psychology was growing into the uh, stature as a science during this period. And advertisers uh, were quick to latch on to key ideas. So the desire for everyone to belong, like, like they are today. And so... It was like basically subconscious fears, nostalgia, patriotism, um, you know, patriotism, and in order to reach their audience. So here's such an ad. Let's check this out. And if you look, we have uh, very, very interesting ads. And they would basically bullshit you like they do today. A mark of a good uh, taste in dress was if you buy this brand. And uh, the secret of success or successful cocktails is Canadian club whiskey, or <laughs> this is like, you know, it's just basic bullshit. And they had to be subjected to this type of uh, psyops uh, back in the olden days as well as we are today. So there was a lot of propaganda going on. So basically like life buoy soap, he is first in health and uses life buoy soap. And they show you a very old elderly man living a long life because he uses life buoy soap. And uh, and we see youthful people as well. And so basically it was propaganda. So if you use this brand soap, you will like live to like 99 like this dude over here. So around 1910, everything was about sex appeal. And so every girl wanted to be what was known as an it girl, like one of these girls in the ad. And so sex did sell mysticium, parfum to heighten the elusive charm of woman. 28 different flowers give their subtle fragrance to the creation of Mysticum, Euro uh, Europe's premier perfume at the better stores. <laughs> Very interesting, and this is the products, and we have perfumes in bottles, actually ready to be sold with the liquid in it. And so you would think by buying Mysticum, perfume, that you would turn into this chick. So in 1927, we have this chick with her vanity right here, and you can see all stuff lined up. Um, she has her parfum or perfume in her hands, and eau de cologne, and we see a fancy bottle, and the refined woman's preference. So basically, if you use that perfume, you are going to be refined and classy. So even during the Victorian times, they were, uh, you know, it was propaganda by this product, um, but not as much as in the early 20th century. So you would basically buy a pretty bottle and take it to a druggist or an apothecary or a dry goods store, buy your oil, have them fill it up. When you were done, bring the bottle back, reuse, reuse, reuse. And then really popularly in the early 20th century, the teens to the 20s, then you would buy ready-made perfume in bottles and you would toss them when you were done. But gladly, this person who once owned this uh, set of perfumes did not toss them and throw them out because now we have them here to take a look at and to see actually how really beautiful these bottles once were, even though they were meant to be thrown in the garbage. Um, it's quite interesting to me that these things still remain um, even over a 100 years ago. These were made, I believe, in 19... 08 or so or something like that uh, again we even have a bottle from the 1970s or 80s that's still here and why why do you think that is because of the design and the beauty of the bottle uh, somebody did not want to throw this bottle out because of its beauty and so it's still here today along with all these other bottles that people just decided not to toss into the garbage thankfully so that we can all look at them and gaze at their gorgeousness and enjoy them. And as a matter of fact, the funny part is every single time I open up a Victorian or antique perfume bottle, I always can still catch a whiff of the perfume that was once inside of it, which actually really, really amazes me. As a matter of fact, I used to work at a dry cleaner when I was a teenager and people would bring their clothes in and I would uh, actually, after they were washed and pressed, I would pack them up with the plastic bags, you know, that would cover them on their hanger. And I still smelt people's perfume on the clothes even after they were washed. 
Um, perfume actually seems to never disappear <laughs> and it still remains in these bottles even though they're empty. So once again, thank you for watching. I hope you learned something. Hope you enjoyed our little bottle history and uh, show and tell. So long.